Thank you, Tim. That was a mouthful. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, and good evening to all alike, faculty, staff, students, and guests. A warm and enthusiastic thank you to the Institute of World Politics for hosting this Constitution Day and to the Jack Miller Center for supporting the lecture. Judging by the search results of Google Scholar, JSTOR, Hein Online, not to mention the indices of numerous scholarly books on the Constitution and the American founding, this is a bit of an ostentatious outlier uh, for Constitution-related lectures in both title and theme. But as Samuel Feiner invoked as the epigram to the man on horseback, his now less well-known than either Huntington or Janowitz's text on civil-military relations in the modern age, in testa eliha un capello con candidi pinocchi e spada al finocchio eliha. I will decline to sing that operatically for you. It's from Mozart's Don Giovanni. But these, light, these lyrics invoke the irresistible dashingness, the panache of the man of action with his cloak and glittering sword and broad feathered hat, bestriding the civilian world outside of a time of war, turning the life of the community around him from black and white into technicolor, as it were. Just think of the large sculpture of the Grant Memorial at the bottom of Capitol Hill, the US Capitol in all its still whiteness of stone and column and all the petty legislative wrangling happening within it notably to its back. Facing away from the Capitol, all the way down to the White House, the Lincoln Memorial, and Arlington National Cemetery beyond, the Grant Memorial is the largest equestrian monument in the United States, with lions, a life-size cavalry group, an artillery group, stampeding horses, swords, battle debris, and flags. I've never found the bears. Soldiers and politics have ever made a seductive match whether in the time of the ancient empires or in our own post-enlightenment age of democracies. Warriors, armed guardians, knights, soldiers, servicemen, servicewomen, private security contractors, mercenaries, however you want to cloak them linguistically speaking. These have ever lived at the edges of civilization, now defending it, now threatening it, a source of security and comfort for civilians and rulers, but also of fear and suspicion. In the words of Reed Robert Bonadonna in Soldiers and Civilization, soldiers walk the weird wall at the edge of civilization. But in the new democratic age of the 18th century constitutional era, and through the specific regime which America's founders constructed and gifted to this new nation conceived in liberty, soldiers perhaps for the first time in history, or at least for the first time in a very long time, were able to come to the heart of the political order and to have a place there from which they would strengthen, not threaten the regime. They would do this not so much in their former military capacity and trappings, or even through their specific areas of military, tactical, operational, or strategic expertise on and off the battlefield, but at the much harder to know, and certainly harder to quantify, level of character and civic function. One might even say they do this at the fundamental level of soul, of the soul of the nation. Despite having no explicit constitutional role in the governing structure of the nation, or a designated political power in terms of a separate branch of government, judges, as you know these days, are continually finding all sorts of new things in the Constitution, but you'll still look in vain for an eighth article on the US Armed Forces in the Constitution, for example. Nevertheless, soldiers have a critical role to play in preserving and even nurturing our constitutional regime. This role is tied to a particular understanding of democratic justice tied to the conception of natural rights and a consequent derivative role for government to play to secure those rights, as much as to the justice and the right of enabling all citizens equally to pursue happiness as the goal of life per se, their non-political or in their private life. This role is also tied to a certain conception of honor, to the honorableness of the person, the citizen, and the regime who uphold this particular expression of political justice. Describing such a role is difficult and even awkward for us today in part because we've lost the vocabulary traditionally used to describe it. This vocabulary looks beyond terminology of political activism, civil disobedience, demonstrations, and mostly peaceful protests, beyond the precepts of contemporary political science, beyond post-Christian Nietzsche-like terminology describing the human psyche and human action in terms of passion, will, and mind, the will to power, in other words, and back to the ancient political philosophic understanding of the human individual soul and human community as being dividable into desire, spiritedness, and reason. And with a host of attenuant human behaviors that can be described and understood as individual virtues or excellences that can and ought to be pursued in support of the larger vision of human community. Plato's Socrates located thumos, 
what we can translate a little more pedestrianly in English as spiritedness, as at the beating heart of political life, as well as at the heart of the mysteries of political life. Why individuals, especially equally free individuals with inherent rights, would want to serve others in a, in a public capacity that essentially puts them inferior to their peers. Spiritedness is the essential quality of human beings who would live free from the oppression of others. In this way, it's associated also with the sense of justice and injustice. It leads an individual to strike back at those who have harmed him or who would harm him. Spiritedness is thus attached to a concern for honor. The soldier citizen and citizen soldier of the title of this lecture is the spirited citizen that is at the heart of the American constitutional regime, who is willing to and who does find civic honor in defending his rights of freedom and equality as also as rights to free government. How America accomplished the bringing home of the soldier figure within the political regime and made it safe for democracy in the aggregate is the theme of these Constitution Day reflections. But spiritedness is ever a source of action. It is dynamic and not static. As such, spiritedness is not entirely tameable, leading to tensions we continue to witness today, not to mention to some current manifestations of those tensions we find very worrisome and dangerous indeed, that are often grouped under words like radicalism and extremism in the ranks or among veterans or certain veteran groupings, for instance. But these worrisome elements too had some presence and even violent expression in the American Revolutionary Era and in the founding days of our republic, not to mention frequently after the majority of major wars in which America has fought. To turn to the figure of the soldier and the question of spiritedness, I'm gonna start a little farther back. It took 700 years for Rome to produce its founding epic, but when Virgil did so at the dawn of the Augustinian imperial age, a novus ordum secularum, to which America's founders would eventually refer in their own new ordering of the age, he thumbed his nose spectacularly at the Greek Homer by encapsulating in just the first two words of the Aeneid, both the entire Iliad and the entire Odyssey. Arma virumque cano, arms and a man I sing. Arma stands for Achilles in the Iliad, virum for Odysseus in the Odyssey. And so we, Virgil's readers, understand that Rome will showcase a superior unity of the Iliadic warring hero and the Odyssean wandering hero where these could only ever be a duality in Greece. In the Iliad, that epitome of all warriors, Achilles can never go home. He stays at the foreign battlefield, waiting to die in action, in order to possess eternal glory and fame. Odysseus, the man of cunning and seeker after knowledge, takes 10 years to get home, but to all intents and purposes, it's a disaster when he does, and soon he sets off from home again, this time not on the sea, but inland, establishing Athena's cult far from the seashore. He does not rule at home. Virgil's next few verses give us the rest of the story. After that man, meaning Aeneas, came from the shores of Troy, after he was tossed about on the sea, after he suffered much in war, then and only then could he found his city, bring his gods into Latium, and establish the Latin race and the walls of lofty Rome. Aeneas presumably first had to learn how to translate his warrior ethos, his spiritedness, away from the fights on the battlefield and against the elements of nature, toward the constructive work of peace, building a city, a people, and a civilization whose unique mission it was to cultivate the arts of peace through moderating rule of law, all backed by a significant defensive posture. Take it as Rome's version of peace through strength. Soldiers are difficult to bring home after war or to have around outside of a time of war. This is not just because of their explicit business, closing with and destroying the enemy with extreme prejudice, uh, to put it in more modern parlance, but because of the certain characteristics they must possess in order to engage effectively in state-sanctioned violence. This is not to mention the dangers they present because of possessing arms and armaments or holding the levers of military technological power, of course. Some might call this aggressiveness or testosterone, but America's founders and the ancients would have called these characteristics ambition, courage, and love of honor. These, of course, have finely tuned distinctions between them, and I invite you all to indulge in reading the treatises of Aristotle, the dialogues of Plato, and the parallel lives of Plutarch to engage with these. But for our purposes today, generally speaking, the spark or the battery putting these characteristics in motion was thumos or spiritedness. And spiritedness being a type of fuel or fire to action is constantly alive, but by itself it has no predetermined goal. It's neutral energy, so to speak outside of a proper vehicle to direct that energy with a good navigation system but better wheels and a highly sensitive braking system, that spiritedness can be politically and socially destructive. 
Alongside desire and reason, spiritedness is one of Socrates' three elements of the soul. Operating in a pre-Marxian world that doesn't take a narrow, economizing view of politics, Socrates describes political order as emerging indirectly from the need people experience to defend their lives, lands, and liberty from the dominating designs of others. We recognize echoes of the Declaration. In Plato's Republic, it's spiritedness that answers this challenge. As a form of anger, spiritedness seeks to overcome all obstacles in its way. It lends itself towards a willingness to kill and be killed, and is the essential quality of human beings who would live free from the oppression of others. In this way, it's also associated with a sense of justice and injustice. It leads an individual to strike back at those who have harmed him. Spiritedness, as I mentioned earlier, is thus attached to a concern for honor. Homer's Achilles demonstrates these dynamics. Homer's muse sings about the anger of Achilles because the thumatic rage with which he kills and desecrates Hector's body in revenge for his friend's death differs nowhere in kind from his rage at the injustice of Agamemnon, the leader of the Greek army face facing Troy. Agamemnon had affronted Achilles' honor as well as undermined the accepted political system of spoils distributed to warriors. Not surprisingly, it's against the backdrop of Achilles that Socrates identifies Thumos as a psychic origin of distinctly political action. Spiritedness as the political passion shows itself as a yearning for victory, superiority, rule, honor, and glory. It's not desire simply, nor desire for just any goal. It's a yearning towards goals that are the most difficult to attain, the freedom of a nation. That's why when it comes to honor, spiritedness translates into the desire for recognition by free individuals, and so gets tied to political liberty, and hence to law, and hence to justice. Spiritedness expresses itself positively as a zeal for justice, negatively as moral indignation when the latter is threatened. Again, in Plato's Republic, the dialogue shows how under these circumstances, spiritedness is the connective tissue through which diverse human beings can become and remain a unified community. And suffused throughout this discussion is the overt role of the guardian or warrior or soldier in accomplishing and maintaining these ends. But as noted, the guardian or soldier can also destroy his community through an excess or misdirection of Thumos, as seen as Shakespeare's Coriolanus, and admirably depicted in Ralph Fiennes' cinematic version of the same. Um, also in Abraham Lincoln's favorite Shakespeare play, Macbeth. The nature of spiritedness, it turns out, is inherently equivocal. Like Cervantes' Don Quixote, the spirited individual is always on the lookout for something, anything that is larger than himself, that will test his mettle. While unacknowledged, some recognition of the ambiguity of Thumos underbly undergirds the caution within with which some within the military-civilian relations community today urge especially about veterans and political candidates. What all these ancient authors understood, therefore, was the necessity of having institutions and other tools of the regime whose purpose was to tie the element of spiritedness always towards the goal of supporting the regime, toward the exercise of the rule of law. Two things in particular stand out on this score. First, the necessity of binding soldiers and their spiritedness, their ambition, and their sense of honor to the preservation of the regime by giving them and showing them they have a tangible and particular stake in the community. Second, the necessity of a civic education or a patriotic education, what we might term an education in and toward the political regime, whose purpose is to help in that binding movement or motion, that civic attachment or patriotism. Without that stake in the community, soldiers or the guardian class have no particular reason to serve it. It must be shown and felt to be theirs, their own, that they benefit from as much as contribute toward. Separated from love of one's own, spiritedness does not operate, and its roots in man's attachment to his own existence make spiritedness less than perfectly reasonable or public-spirited, writes Catherine Zuckert in Understanding the Political Spirit. She adds, a man may risk his life to defend his homeland, but if he survives, he will claim his just reward. This is the second challenge and opportunity for any political regime to figure out. The thought that rulers and ruling generals, those with political and or military power, ought to receive more, more honor, more money, more freedom, more power, to compensate them for their public service is a cause of the generation of regimes Socrates portrays in Book Eight of the Republic. This is the man on horseback phenomena that America has worked so hard to prevent within its borders. And as Aristotle observed in the politics, all groups contribute something to the polity as a whole and all tend to value their own contributions more than other groups do. Continuing deliberation and conflict about the just distribution of rewards are thus endemic to all political orders. And indeed, this particular deliberation and conflict has manifested itself throughout American history, particularly when it comes to soldiers and veterans. 
from everything from the Newburgh conspiracy, the Pennsylvania mutiny after the American Revolution, the founding of the very first lobbying organization, the Grand Army of the Republic, or GAR, in the wake of the Civil War, to the Bonus Army after World War I, and even including the unsavory black spot on American civic asocial history, the Ku Klux Klan, founded by Confederate War veterans. This manifests itself also in contemporary legislative battles over benefits, whether education, healthcare, disability, or exemption from taxes for members of the military, military families, um, and veterans. But to bridge the historical and philosophical distance between the ancient past and the American founding, not to mention to today, these Plato, Homer, and Virgil related observations and insights about the origins of politics and the challengedness, challenges of spiritedness and the spirited individual are helpful in understanding what are the ties that link soldiers and politics, whether in general and theoretically or more particularly, in a constitutional design and at the level of citizens, whether in the nation's formal uniform or not. What the American founders knew for certain from their theoretical forebears was that in passing from the revolutionary era to the constitutional era, the spiritedness with which they fought for the liberty of their new nation and for their individual rights on the battlefield would need to be translated into a deep connection with the new constitution, the constitutional order, and to the particularly American expression of the rule of law and defense of freedom and equality. That such tamed, if you will, spiritedness would guard against the phenomena happening again of an accumulative long train of abuses and usurpations, whether from their own government or from foreign sources, this time through the ballot box and not through the use of bullets. One form of this spiritedness would thus be vigilance about government overreach, whether federally or at the state and local level. Here perhaps is the seed of those ever present but sometimes sleepy today watchdog organizations. But here too can be understood the term limits which the founders did consecrate in the Constitution, otherwise known as frequent elections. They expected American citizens to be vigilant enough to elect new congressmen, senators, governors, and presidents into office when the incumbents no longer were fulfilling their duties or no longer reflected in the legislation they passed the wishes and desires and common sense of justice of their voting citizens. Another expression, of course, and obviously, would be this vigilance in terms of national security and defense, of watchfulness towards our enemies, and the maintenance of prudent diplomatic, military, and trade ties with friends and allies abroad. But yet another expression of this spiritedness would be courage, once again, off the battlefield as well as on it. How this translated particularly from the era of the American Revolution to the constitutional era, John Adams explained in his letters, in terms of participation by the citizenry in local government broadly understood, and how local government brings the experience of political self-rule within the reach of the many. Adams was prior to Tocqueville, in fact, in noticing the importance of local self-government in forming the American character. Adams argued that local government was one of the four main factors leading to the success of the American Revolution. The inhabitants of New England town he, towns, he writes, are invested with certain powers and privileges, including the right to assemble and to choose their selectmen, constables, collectors of taxes, and above all, their representatives in the legislature. The right deliberate upon the public affairs of the town or to give instructions to the representatives in the legislature mean that the people acquired from their infancy the habit of discussing, of deliberation, and of judging of public affairs. This is how the institutions of local self-government helped to form an American law of opinion. In Adams' words, the revolution was in the minds and hearts of the people. It was a change in their religious sentiments of their duties and obligations. And this radical change in the principles, opinions, sentiments, and affections of the people was the real American Revolution. After the ratification of the Constitution, all this comes to be expressed th through the judiciary as it is functioned or as it functioned in its original rather than today's practical form. The judiciary involves citizens in the administration of justice through jury service. It accustoms them to think that they are not passively victimized by circumstances outside of their control, but instead belong to a confident, self-governing people. James Wilson, praising the beneficent effects of jury service, writes that to promote a habitual courage and dignity and independence of sentiment and of actions in the citizens should be the aim of every wise and good government. How much are these principles promoted by this beautiful and sublime effect of our judicial system? I wonder what he would say today. And even among the anti-federalists, a writer going by the name of Federal Farmer writes that the jury, along with elected legislative bodies, is the means by which the people are let into the knowledge of public affairs 
are enabled to stand as guardians of each other's rights. And finally, as Ralph Lerner has demonstrated, judges were expected to play a role in teaching a Republican citizenry its rights and duties through their written opinions and their instructions to jurors. He argues that this educative function was best performed by the thoughtful opinions of the Supreme Court. Thinking of the role of the judiciary and the role of the citizenry in the judiciary via jury duty gets us directly to the concern for justice and the stake in the community and its continued operation for the rule of law that Socrates had noted was fundamental for spiritedness to work toward the health of the body politic. The jury system, but the educational system at large, was thus always thought of by the American founders and their followers as being critical institutions through which to educate continued generations of Americans into how to be American citizens, into transmitting to them the requisite attitudes, knowledge, and behaviors. Key among these attitudes was an acknowledged shared responsibility for the common good. Whereas in a monarchy, the king or single sovereign bears responsibility for the common good, the US Constitution assigns the responsibility to the sovereign people, to we the people. But how, how do you make we the people care about anything other than their individual selves? Especially when their sovereignty flows from a theory of natural rights that automatically elevates the importance of the private sphere. Madison famously observed in Federalist 55 that Republican government presupposes qualities in human nature which justify a certain position of esteem and confidence and to a higher degree than does any other form of government. This seems to imply that Republican citizens consciously cultivate attitudes and behaviors or virtues that harmonize their self-interest with the good of the community. Madison added to this observation in Federalist 51 and Federalist 10 that his more which are, of course, his more frequently cited um, and somber comments about the imperfect human nature and the corresponding need for institutions and constitutional arrangements to keep up, to pick up the slack. To collect, form, and refine the will of society, the essential backbone to a uniform system of laws that reflects a shared understanding of what it means to ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, and promote the general wel welfare, a people depends on the possibility of communication. And for communication, as we are increasingly finding out today, courage is also very much needed. Communication is the necessary vehicle to give voice to the public will in order for it to be acted upon. Thus, Madison emphasized the desirability of a republic of mean extent in which a certain kind of majority can feasibly form without it becoming factious or tyrannical. Key to this enabling uh, this type of majority are both political institutions, such as a House of Representatives distinct from a Senate, and whatever generates intercourse of sentiments. These include such things as good roads, domestic commerce, a free press, and particularly a circulation of newspapers through the entire body of the people, as Madison wrote later in the party press essays, Public Opinion. There is, of course, the intercourse of political sentiments, but there is equally an intercourse of less tangible sentiments and emotions that Madison knows the Republic must rely on for there to be a people united in it. In Federalist 14, Madison takes note of the mingled blood which American citizens have shed in the defense of their sacred rights, which consecrate their union and excite horror at the idea of their becoming aliens, rivals, enemies. Their blood, he says, commonly shed in defense of their rights, knits them together in a, the very fabric of this new form of Republican government by so many cords of affection, as he puts it. Thus, at the foundation of the Union, perhaps even constituting the vital springs of that Union, Madison places a shared communicated affection and a shared knowledge about what is sacred to it, its originating principles. Echoing the resounding final paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, Madison's reminder is that the mutual pledge of lives, of material support and honor that enable the Union to exist both nourishes and is nourished by a particular set of known and enunciated principles. These must be repeatedly communicated or shared with new generations of citizens, whether children or immigrating adults. Affection as a passion or emotion is vital but inherently tricky because it is less facile to pass down generationally and to a multitude. It is also less stable than reason, but an appeal to reason can help spark it. The founding generation as a whole frequently articulated the need for a robust system of edu public education to inform and undergird the cords of affection in order for the people to remain the mutual guardians of their mutual happiness. As with affection and the passions and reason, so with spiritedness and reason or justice. The success, at least in the first century after the ratification of the Constitution, can be seen by a remarkable multi-day event that occurred at the end of the Civil War. 
More than 150,000 soldiers from the Army of the Potomac, of the Tennessee, and of Georgia undulated up Pennsylvania Avenue May 23, 18, 1865, a month after Abraham Lincoln's murder. Flanked by admiring civilians who had hastened to the capital city for the event, a remnant of the Union's core troops marched in grand review before legislators and dignitaries over the course of two days. Newspapers, the Philadelphia North American and the New York Tribune included, asserted that the event was the greatest tribute possible to free government, that only under democratic institutions could such a mass of armed men be trusted in a capital city. It was meant to be a national pageant. It was also, of course, a convenience of marching these troops through Washington who had to return from Virginia and the Carolinas by way of the Capitol to be mustered out. Within the next six months alone, the government would retire to civilian status more than 800,000 soldiers. And as they were discharged, the Union soldiers were greeted by variations of a message that streamed on that May Day from the Capitol, proclaiming the only national debt we can never pay is the debt we owe the victorious Union soldiers. To the public, the Grand Review was an unforgettable revelation of national muscle, of its manhood under arms. Other civilian populations in other countries throughout history might have been made anxious at war's end by large amounts of, so, of suddenly un unoccupied soldiers, but Americans did not doubt that their soldiers would reintegrate as citizens into peacetime society. Turning citizens into soldiers and soldiers back into citizens had been a democratic experiment already, championed by General Washington, which on the whole the young nation had successfully managed following its first Revolutionary War. Neither the large numbers of combatants nor the scale in both territory and violence of the Civil War had upset Americans' conviction about the citizen veteran. What Americans were less certain about was how to materialize the debt owed to citizen soldiers who had defended their collective rights and property. The nation was equally undecided about what concrete payment gratitude and a democratic justice demanded for military veterans. The core tenets of a liberal democracy complicate such questions, since military service is not simply the ultimate expression of civic virtue, but is also the highest duty of citizenship, one the country has a right to invoke in its times of need. Whether volunteered virtue should trump conscripted duty from the standpoint of the federal ledger books, or vice versa, is not obvious. With every major conflict involving Americans, the nation has reevaluated its relationship with the veteran and the soldier, partly in consequence of the demands each specific war required it to lay upon the soldier in the first place. The changing face of industrialized society and the technologies of war, as well as political thought, have influenced each generation's consensus, reflected just in the range of pension legislation alone. The early practice of granting only disability pensions to war veterans grew to include service pensions after the War of 1812, to professional or vocational training after World War I, to college tuition assistance and low interest home loans after World War II, and finally, to all who have served in uniform, whether during war or peacetime, wounded or not. The new dynamics of an all-volunteer military established in 1973, celebrating its 50th anniversary, its 50th birthday this July, have further affected national attitudes toward the citizen soldier turned citizen veteran, although perhaps less visibly, given that less than 1% of the US population now serves in the armed forces, or even during wartime. How veterans themselves have responded to their new status as citizen soldiers turned soldier citizens has traditionally reflected national attitudes. Beyond any effects of combat, the equation of individual civic duty and civic virtue and the nation's reciprocal duty and virtue has influenced, although not dictated, veterans' social and political behavior. Aside from any significant role citizen soldiers fill in defending the country, citizen veterans have played a defining role in the shaping of American political culture that has not been widely appreciated. To bring this to a close, in Democracy in America, a thoughtful Alexis de Tocqueville cautions that nothing is so dangerous as an army in the heart of a democratic nation. In a democracy, the entire army in the end makes up a separate little nation in which intelligence is less extensive and habits coarser than in the general public, he notes. Certainly he was an officer. A difference exacerbated by the general habits of the wealthy, the educated, and the skilled not to engage in military careers. But by that same token, Tocqueville also speculates that the democratic nation tempers such danger because it is forced to conscript citizens for its defense. Though democracies will always have some citizens naturally attracted to military life and its accoutrements, the majority will most likely think of military service as a passing obligation and will therefore reserve their passions and ambitions for civilian life than for martial grandeur. 
They bow to their military duties, he says, but their souls remain attached to the interests and the desires they were filled with in civil life. They therefore do not take up the spirit of the army. Rather, they bring the spirit of society within the army and preserve it there. In democratic peoples, it is the plain soldiers who most remain citizens. It is over them that national habits keep the best hold and public opinion has the most powers. It is through the soldiers above all, this is Tocqueville still, that one can pride oneself on having a democratic army pervaded by the love of freedom and the respect for rights that one was able to inspire in the people themselves. Tocqueville anticipates the findings of 20th century social science and concludes that the citizen soldier in the democratic nation brings to bear his influence on the military institution and not the other way around. That the new democratic or American soldier will inevitably display a faithful image of the nation. Leaned forward, Tocqueville's point does not merely make safe the potential exercise of force for democracy, but calms distrust about militarized individuals' ability to reintegrate into civilian society. Because soldiers in an American-style democracy are civilians first and last, they are not doomed to become an isolated society unto themselves, an alien faction with interest to pursue counter to the good of society at large. This is in no, no small degree because through the marriage of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, the American constitutional order achieved something far more epic than Virgil anticipated in his or in Homer's epic, a way to bring the soldier with his spirited soul home to the heart of the constitutional order by in part making it an expectation for every American citizen to cultivate a spirited soul toward the preservation of the justice of the American political experiment and toward the, his rights of freedom and equality and by crowning this effort in the sacred terms of pledging to each other our sacred honor. Through the unity of spiritedness and justice, a love of freedom and equality, and the honor that the pursuit of that in and across every generation brings, we can find in our legal founding document, the Constitution, a soul of constitutional poetry all of its own. Let us celebrate that. Thank you. <laughs> I am happy to take questions. What time is it? Oh, maybe we have the time. Oh, okay. Yes, we have plenty of time. Yes. Uh, mm. That was a brilliant theoretical and historical observation. I have a question that is equally theoretical, <laughs> but not quite as profound as your. Uh, I am doing a manuscript which is well over 300 pages right now, and I'm not sure of its thesis. It's entitled, United We Stand. And the thesis is that the preempt, that, that unification, united we stand, not divided we fall, that's the conclusion. Mm -hmm. That unification was a more powerful and theoretical uh, uh, expansion of, of America's mind in the 18th century and that Robert Morris, I think his name is Robert Morris, who wrote the preamble of the Constitution towards a more perfect union, was that preamble overtakes Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be so self-evident. That is, the Constitution was underpinned and defined by the virtue of unification the Declaration and the, in, and the Independence Movement were based upon individual and, uh, equality and all other ac aspects of individuality. I want your comments on my thesis because I'm not positive <laughs> that I'm correct. The unification <laughs> supersedes the individuals. Yes. Mm. Would you please comment? Thank you. Well, I'm just, I'm gonna crib a lot from Abraham Lincoln here because he was much, much smarter, more brilliant than I am on this point. I mean, he turned to the Declaration by showing that the Union was, was the important uh, preceding factor of the rest, of the whole rest of the American experiment. So he, he said, he put it in terms of the Declaration and the Constitution being the apple of gold and the frame of silver. So the Constitution is the framework around which, or, or which gives expression to, completes the picture of the Declaration. And that declaration, I mean, what we, we focus so, so much on those first two beautifully written, you know, powerful par paragraphs and the declaration of, of, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident, um, that all men are created equal. 
And we forget that, in fact, the document is a public diplomacy document. It is a rhetorical document that is crafted um, to give a, un a unity to the American people, to make an American people. Or this is, this is one of my arguments about the Declaration, is that it is crafting an American people. And it's building off of works um, that Jefferson and others had written beforehand, notably the um, Summary View of the Rights of British America, um, which he had written, I'm going to get the date wrong now. I want to say it's in the late 60s, 1760s, but I don't think, I think it's 1774, maybe? Someone here knows better than I am. Um, <laughs> uh, don't tell my history teacher. Anyway. Um, um, but, but the idea being uni unity, the union, is of course fundamental to this entire project. It's why there were those compromises within some of the articles and sections of the, of the Constitution itself so that there could be a union that then could be made more perfect um, through time, uh, through, through the different workings out. Um, and once again, to, to bring it back to Lincoln is why the Gettysburg Address um, is so powerfully not about the dead. It is about the living and the tasks we have before us uh, to continue this project of, of the Declaration, of, of the Constitution, of unity, of the freedom um, and equality um, and liberal rights. Is that? <laughs> sure, sure. Um, I mean, but you know, but you know, the other side note is that it is a long-standing uh, debate within American politics and American political theory about about that relation of the Declaration and Constitution, whether what Lincoln did was to nullify or, uh, in a way, you know, or or, or make um, uh, obsolete certain certain of those questions about equality and freedom by by emphasizing the union before all of those things. Um, I think he has a convincing argument about the connections. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for the comments. I mean, very insightful and uh, very thought-provoking. Uh, a couple of uh, comments first and then, and then, a, and then a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the things you talked about really make you think about the role between the military or uh, leaders, particularly martial leaders, in a revolution and how governments are set up. So the idea of the man on horseback, you know, some people would say that George Washington could have been the ultimate man on horseback. As soon as you said that, I started thinking about kind of the Latin American context of Cadillo, you know, the, the man on horseback that's going to take care of things mm -hmm. and potentially be a leader. Uh, you said two other things that were very important, I think, uh, for our Constitution and our country when it came to the military. One, uh, the upcoming anniversary of the all-volunteer force. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's going to be very important as we're coming out of Vietnam, who decides that we're going to do that, why we're going to do that. And then in two years, we'll have the celebration of the anniversary of the United States Army. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm, I'm a, a soldier, retired officer, uh, so in many ways, the Army's always very proud to say that the Army is older than the country. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that has a lot of uh, ways you can look at that and, and positive things mm -hmm. you can take from that. But my question really is, why did you choose this topic for the Constitution Day? You know, usually <laughs> it's going to be some political thing, it's going to be about uh, looking back and you mm -hmm. did a great job, mm -hmm. uh, how the American experience reflects back on what, you know, what they're going through in the mm -hmm. British experience. But why did you choose this, the idea of the military constitution? To echo words from one of my, my favorite um, friend professors, Jakob Griegel, because I'm interested in it, <laughs> uh, so selfishly, but, but for multiple reasons. One is um, I'm very well aware that uh, many of the students um, at the Institute of World Politics have a military affiliation. Um, and in fact, in political theory terms, or these types of talks, it's very rarely something that's dwelt on or, or thought about. Um, I have spent a considerable portion of my, my uh, professional career here in DC thinking about how the, the military life cycle veterans, the, the nexus um, between uh, soldiers in uniform and citi citizens in uniforms and soldiers you know, out of uniform, um, how, how they reflect um, or tell us some things, reveal some things about our American democracy and the state of American democracy. I love, I love the phrase from Tocqueville about soldiers being, or the army being the mirror of the nation. Uh, because we have so many um, prejudices coming out of the Vietnam War about who actually serves, the history of that, what it means, um, you know, whether that, you know, whether some people think that means that they are less educated and, and desperate and that's why they're serving in the military, um, or whether that means that they think they're only conservative and Republican and extremists or something like that, neither of which are true. Um, they are broadly reflective, um, essentially of the, of the middle class. Um, and, um, and, and so thinking about all the different ways. I'm also a, a trained in political theory. This is the one area that 
not everyone has written 5,000 dissertations on as they have of Aristotle and, and, Paul, and Plato. <laughs> um, and, and it's very relevant to today. Um, you know, Heraclitus says that war is the universal fire, which means that thinking about civil military relations and, and setting the boundaries within your political regime, in fact, are your boundaries about how you think, about citizenship, about political order, about rule, about, and you know, if you just think about the difference between Arlington National Cemetery and Pericles' famous um, you know, funeral speech in which he says that um, the individual absolutely subsumes and his, his name is not known um, around the world because it's Athens' name. But if you go to Arlington and every American cemetery, Every soldier, every, and by soldier, by the way, I should have said this at the beginning, I don't just mean soldiers in the army, I catch all term, that means soldiers, airmen, sailors, guardians, all the rest of it. Um, I, I love all the branches. <laughs> um, but each, each one of those individuals has their own particular headstone, meaning that we actually believe each individual has the right to be recognized and their individual contributions to be recognized towards that larger um, um, defense. So, so those are some of the reasons why I chose that, that particular, and, and um, something that didn't make it into this, because I was worried about length, <laughs> uh, there are so many things to talk about, um, is in terms of the 250th uh, um, of America coming up in 2026, and the, the birthday of the army, and anniversary of all this, Jefferson, in fact, um, is very important for the army specifically, and for national security as a whole. He is the one who actually established West Point. That's why the, the library at West Point is the Jefferson Library. Um, so, so since I am affiliated with the Thomas Jefferson Foundation at Monticello, I have to throw in a, a note for Jefferson. I also emailed her three weeks ago. I said, Rebecca, I need a constitution this year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Uh -huh. yeah. I, yes. Um, I like your comments on the, the jury, jury, on jury duty. And so I'm wondering, is there any data, polls, opinions, uh, or polls on how veterans or active service members view jury duty when they get called in? Are they more inclined to take it seriously because of their sense of obligation or less inclined because they've already done their duty elsewhere? Mm. Uh, a very interesting question. Um, I would say in general, and I, I am pretty sure that there's at least one survey, but it was like five years ago that I looked at that may have included jury service and attitudes towards jury service on it. In general, what we know is that um, those who've served in the military are more actively politically involved in terms of civic obligations, in terms of voting, in terms of, of uh, serving in civic associations, in terms of uh, knowing their neighbors even, um, in, in terms of volunteering. Um, all, of those, all of those kind of civic markers, in fact, they have um, a high a high health factor um, compared to their civilian peers, um, which I would say would include um, jury duty. The one thing that makes jury duty so complicated now, or talking about it, or, or enabling anyone to participate in it, is that we don't, most trials never actually occur. Um, so much, the majority are settled outside. Um, so the possibility of even participating in the, the jury system as it was originally attended no longer exists for, for, for many people. Um, Side, side note, but you know, sometimes the, the, the TV shows of our culture show us um, individual things. This past summer, past year, um, Amazon actually sponsored a TV show called The Jury Duty. Um, I don't know, you know this, right? Um, and it's, it's, it's based on kind of a, a scam in a way. Um, they, they, they find an individual who um, they say they're going to be filming a documentary about the jury system. Um, but it's in fact, it's not a real trial. You know, it's also everyone is an actor except for him. And he doesn't find out until the very, very end, the, the very last day. Um, but you see, um, and I've talked to lawyer friends who, you know, who actually participate in juries. They say everything that happens in that series has happened in their courtroom, in their trials. And you see this one individual, young man, you know, I, can't, I think he's from California, um, participate and for the first time thinking through some of just like, oh, what is law? What is democracy? What are rights? What, are, well, what is this person owed versus that person? How do I lead, you know, I'm the, I'm the, the juryman? <laughs> like, what does that mean? Um, and I know, you know, from anecdotal evidence of speaking with, with veterans, some of them when they actually have their first, I, so I should step back. I anticipated that because uh, those who've served in the military are some of the only ones who have a touch point with actual government, 
their, like, their checks come from them, they make an oath, you know, et cetera, they might have more of an awareness of, of some of government. It turns out that is so not true, um, both, I guess, fortunately and unfortunately. Um, but after their terms of service, often when they're thinking about their next steps, um, you know, their next branch of service, if you will, their civilian service, um, they do become interested in these questions about what actually the composition of government is. Um, and, oh, you need political parties, and oh, you, you know, these different types of things, and start to be involved in, in those ways. Um, there is, of course, the other side of that equation. Um, some, some military students that I taught this summer who, in talking about service afterwards, um, their immediate reaction was very negative um, to Admiral Mullins, I think it was 2008, um, kind of notice or directive about continuing their service in a civilian sphere. Their reaction was, we just did our service, give us a break. So there's, there's that too. Long, long answer, but. Mm -hmm. The demographics and the optics? No, more like that the Secretary of Defense has to be ah. removed from military service and things mm -hmm. like that. I, I think, um, well, as our current discourse of the, and since 2016 have shown, most Americans are very confused about what that all means. Um, um, even, you know, even in, in Washington, D.C. Um, and a lot of that is because um, over the past 20 years, since the advent of the all-volunteer force, so few actually serve. It's not an institution that is widely visible, um, it, which is a little bit of a, um, of a riddle because it seems all around us, right? We thank you for your service. You know, everyone, when you get on a plane, you hear you know, about soldiers on active duty um, who are able to board first. But as an institution, what, what military service actually means is so little in front of people that there is a significant amount of the country that actually believes you don't need a military. Um, they have no idea what it does. They have no idea, say, that the Navy is the most important thing for their Amazon Prime you know, to arrive the next day because they're the ones keeping the shipping lanes open all around the world. Um, so when that, when, that, when that goes up, you can say the verticals of, of what hierarchy is, power sharing. Um, you know, vaguely, maybe, someone who is slightly educated in American government and political theory might know it's important that the Secretary of, of Defense is not actually a serving um, member of the military. But if you asked on the street, most would think that they actually are in the military. Um, so it is important to constantly clarify. And, and it also is important, you know, that civic education element is important for civic education within the branches of the military um, so that they themselves understand what it's this document and this way of life that they have sworn to defend. Um, and we don't do a super good job of that, either in our public education system and especially in our military. I can keep on going. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but if that's... I'll ask one other quick okay. question. Uh, mm -hmm. At one point you were mentioning the benefits mm -hmm. for <clears throat> uh, draftees versus volunteer soldiers. At one point, were they different? Did Absolutely. They in fact, it used to be you only got them if you were a draftee. So this is a really interesting, um, very, I would say, important um, political discussion or moment. Um, it was around World War I. Um, actually, it was a, a Roosevelt um, who was thinking about this, um, not the president, um, I think his son, um, who, who was serving. And the, the idea was, if we're forced, if we have been forced um, to serve in the military, we have been forcibly taken out of the civilian sector and of making a certain amount of wages because their wages were so much lower. And so you are, the government is creating inequality. And so the government therefore owes those of us who it forced to do this, the back wages. What then can you do to fulfill those back wages? Because you can't because everyone is going to have a different job, you could say, so how do you, you know, you can't just give everyone a blank check, especially, you know, World War I going into 
Great Depression when they didn't have any money, uh, when the government didn't have any money. So one of those ideas was that introduction of education benefits um, and service rehabilitation, so, so um, skill training, um, and the end especially towards those who had uh, received some type of wound or disability in the war. So that I would say is the one difference, um, is prior to World War I, it didn't matter whether you had been conscripted or volunteered, if you were wounded in war, you would get particular amounts of, of care um, you know, that the government would pay for or give you an IOU for um, or cover um, or a pension that you could qualify for. Um, and that started after, well, in fact, um, in many of the colonies, there, was, there were some provisions, um, which is an interesting element to note, that even in Plymouth Colony, there was a provision for veterans, um, that, the, that the community, the government, would provide some type of help if they had been wounded in defense of the, the fort or the colony. Um, but other than that, so our entire system now um, is completely different uh, from that, since it doesn't make a distinction between um, those who have been, um, we don't have a conscript you know, um, force now, but um, in the 70s or, or regarding Vietnam War veterans, um, no, no difference. Could make yeah. an argument if you volunteer, you should get more. <laughs> Could also make an argument you get less. <laughs> um, well, and, and another very, very important point, and you know, kind of why I, I mentioned that this question of what veterans are owed, you know, or what soldiers are owed is actually so, is a very fundamental question to our democracy is, I mean, it gets back to this question of who gets what? Um, what does the government pay for you? And all of the, most of that system of benefits, in fact, that is what then Social Security and Medicare gets, gets um, um, piggybacked on. LBJ and others looked at that and said, hey, well, we should get this for everyone. Like, why do only those who served get that? Um, and then you get this you know, entire society-wide um, system, uh, a safety, safety system, and then the question from the opposite side is, well, now that all anyone by being a citizen can qualify for these things, why should we have a separate military benefit system? You know, and it's kind of a, I see um, some of the discussions about you know, military benefits, veterans benefits, trending towards that, that discussion, because uh, we haven't had it in a long time, and there have been backlashes after some of these very huge um, outlays um, in the past, after the War of 1812 after World War I, um, even after the Civil War, about how much of the federal deficit or, or money was being spent on a small portion of the population, veteran soldiers. Um, so I think, I think it's something that veteran advocates say and, and those um, looking at military personnel policy have to be aware of and be thinking of um, with, with prudence and foresight so they can reform within ways you know, to maintain some of those things. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have another 300 page book? This is very <laughs> practical and very mundane. Uh, to summarize the last question, uh, as you know, American political culture is under siege and under challenge. Uh, do you feel that the Constitution itself is safe beyond any? Aspiration. How do you feel about that? <laughs> well, um, you know, Constitution is, is kind of the English word for, a modern English word for a very old concept of the political regime, the way of life of a people that includes its, its habits, its, its way of laws, its, its adherence to the way of law, and how that shaped their own understanding of their behaviors. In, in that kind of framework of things, Americans do not live their lives by the Constitution in any notable um, way. And that is its own, you could say, tragedy, I would think. Um, I think, in many ways. Um, it helps to explain you know, why it's not a limiting document really for us any longer. It helps to explain why numerous congressmen at various aspects, when it's invoked, you know, report or re retort with a chortle. Who, what's the Constitution? Who cares about that? Um, from that aspect, yes, I do. I worry very much. Um, if no one knows, you know, what the Constitution is or why it is a framework, um, you, you can say um, within which we have designated our particular behaviors of government and forms. Then no one's going to understand in which ways it sh it can and should be reformed. And then we have the discussions like we have today of well, we just jettison it. You know, we don't need it um, without really a conception of well, what comes in its place. 
you know, or, or why? Or why is it, why particularly in America is it a document that is so hard um, and to, to alter and, and why it, it challenges us in our soul in a way that changing the constitution in France, for instance, or Italy or Britain, um, not that they really have a constitution, but um, generally speaking, um, doesn't, it doesn't elicit those types of things because it's not about the essence of what America is. Um, you know, but that's where I also want to you know, put on a little optimism into the, the cynicism and say, but I also agree with Madison in the Federalist Papers, which is if you believe that Republican government is possible, you have to believe that the educational process across every generation can at least reach enough people to form enough souls, enough attitudes, enough behaviors, and enough affection, you could say, or attachment to this form that it will be enabled to preserve. Yeah. So. <laughs>